My name is John McClurg. I am currently the Vice President and Ambassador at Large of Silence. Uh, just having arrived there after serving as the Chief Security Officer for about five years for Michael Dell at Dell Corporation and before that a number of other large U.S. corporations, Honeywell, Lucent, Bell Labs, and before that I did a stint in government for over a decade with all the three-letter agencies. And before that did a decade in, in academia. Proceed a, pursued a PhD in a critical field of study known as hermeneutics before being pulled away by the FBI because they thought they needed a hermeneuticist. It's probably one of the more obscure fields of study that I guess one could pursue. It's a, it's a look at a hodgepodge of psychology, sociology, anthropology, philosophy, and linguistics. It looks at the variables around which human beings construct and impute meaning to their world. So whether you're a computer scientist looking at a log, you're interpreting. If you're a spouse fighting with your children, you're interpreting them. If you're reading a text or if you're trying to look at the Constitution and make sure that laws being passed are consistent with it, you're interpreting. Hermeneutics underlies everything. One uh, set of parties we know is very powerfully motivated and has you know, considerable resources and could well be creative is the, the Five Eyes Alliance, and they recently said, uh, they recently basically put the social networks and secure messaging systems of the, of the world on notice uh, that they either need to provide access or face a combination of uh, regulation and who knows what. Well, and indeed, these aren't individuals who have to fling what we call fear, uncertainty, and doubt around in order to make their point and to get people's attentions. The world we live in is indeed a very dangerous, risky place. I think most people on whatever side of that discussion you may, may fall appreciate that the world we live in today is very dangerous. Yep. That's the world I've grown up in my professional life, whether I was fighting terrorism, chasing spies or freakers or hackers. In many instances, the, the threats that we're facing are real. They're called clear and present. They're imminent. And uh, should they strike, we know and have evidence that the consequences could be very severe. So that's sort of a, an accepted uh, foundation upon which the dialogue or discussion is being advanced. At the same time, I, I can't help, and again, this is my hermeneutics coming in, but I'm reflecting back on one of my favorite philosophers, a guy named George Santayana. He was famous for having said that if you don't learn from the past, you're condemned to repeat it. And just at a time in America's history when I had just caught and done battle with one of the first freakers or hackers in our history was at the time when new technologies were emerging in the United States. In this case, it was the, in the telephone systems. We had IP technology that was, internet protocol was coming out, voice over IP was on the, on the horizon. There was no small consternation on the part, not of the five eyes, but of the significant law enforcement and intelligence agencies of the United States that this new innovative technology was going to kick the legs out from under us in our abilities to mitigate real, clear, and present dangers that were coming at us. And so there was a lot of hand-wringing. Uh, much of the early discussions is very similar to what I seem to hear and, and have read going on here in, in Australia about what will happen if indeed you know, you grant certain capabilities to law enforcement and just how should you go about doing that. What we run the risk of doing is forgetting that dialogue and that discussion, how rich it was. A lot of these discussions that we're seeing rise up once again, both here in Australia and in, to some extent in the United States the past year, when you think of some of the discussions that happened between the large tech companies and the, the intelligence community. I, 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 it was a deja vu experience. And why are we wringing our hands and reworking these issues yet again well, I'm afraid it's like George Santana said, if you don't remember the past and those experiences you had where you've already grappled with the specter of a new technology on the horizon and what it might mean for law enforcement, and we work through that in partnership with the legislature, the tech companies, and law enforcement, working as a community, understanding the equities and interests, we came up with a solution. We leveraged, at least in the United States, the, the judicial, the role of the judiciary and the fact that they provide a critical oversight of the way in which law enforcement would utilize whatever technical capability was developed because of funding that they put in place. And that with that oversight, that act as a real mitigating force against the abuse or the fears that one might otherwise have that somehow law enforcement or the five eyes or, you know, intelligence service, we're going to somehow come in and wield this capability in a way that is in, in, way, in no way controlled. It's the old classic question, 
who's going to watch the watchers and making sure you have that in place. And I lived in that world. I, I testified before the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, Act court, and, and I, I lived under the burden of having to articulate the probable cause sufficient for that judge to sign and say, yes, you may invoke these technological provisions that we worked so hard back in 1994 to create for you. You may go ahead and invoke that in furtherance of your investigation against a force poised to commit a real, not a, a fake or a fear or uncertainty, doubt. it was an actual, not a possible or probable, but an actual or imminent threat, you may go ahead and use that. There's an argument that says that mm -hmm. you use this technology mm -hmm. only when necessary and, yeah. and, and you take it very, very seriously before you deploy it. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also instances that the, the, the mere fact of creation of this sort of thing creates a risk that it gets reused for the wrong purpose. Yeah. So, you know, Stuxnet, uh, yeah. WannaCry, I mean, I, I heard a presentation earlier this year from the, uh, the GCSC, um, the Global uh, yeah. Security of Cyberspace, and, and, and they say it's not fair that we fund, that citizens fund the development of cyber weapons uh, that end up, you know, destroying the, uh, the the same hospitals and the same telephony systems that their taxes also pay for. Yeah. Well, and in the wake of uh, Snowden, of course, yeah. uh, his arguments again they didn't resonate with me because he said he didn't think the controls would work, and therefore that's why he was not going to try and embrace the structure that had been in place to control things. I, you know, I said, well, I lived under that same control system and then felt like I was always had being watched, either with internal mechanisms within the FBI or external mechanisms within the Department of Justice. Everywhere, every place I turned, there was these controls and oversights. And I keep thinking back to that movie with uh, Bill Murray, uh, that was Ghostbusters, where they mm -hmm. said, you know, when think about the worst thing you could think could happen, cats and dogs living together, you know, and that's what people were predicting if we passed this CALEA, it was called, Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement uh, Act. Uh, that we passed CALEA and sure enough, cats and dogs didn't start living together. All those things, again, because of the controls that were put in place. So, I mean, that it's possible. Um, I think, again, pragmatically, we as humans are, are quick to adapt. If indeed some remote possibility or some, some actuality occurs that, that suggests that there's a flaw or a weakness in what our best and brightest minds could produce, we take that data in, we make an adjustment, and we, tw we twist and, and flow with it. Um, trying to find that sweet balance between not just giving the bad guys unfettered uh, you know, reign in that environment while also trying to protect these interests that are important to all of us. AI and machine learning have, have obvious applicability uh, in, in InfoSec because, you know, you, you, as you pointed out, you've got to collect a lot of data and you, you want silicon to operate on it, not, not carbon. Um, so can you just explain to us how Silence uses AI and ML? Yeah, and I, uh, I'm an attorney by training. In fact, my worst uh, grade at university was calculus, I think. So that I'm hanging out with these mathiacs, so these brainiacs in math is somewhat amusing to me. But how I basically explain it is that what we've done is instead of trying to keep pace with these ever-evolving signatures or virus signatures that are morphing and always having to come up with what we call that first sacrificial lamb. We need the first victim out of whom we can extract the, the virus so we can make an anti-venom. Uh, instead of going down that path all the way, we basically put uh, these very bright mathematicians in a room for three years and forced them basically to produce what I call basically the genomic signature, genomic, the genome of the, the internet, just like we did the human genome these mathematicians were able to leverage their math to survey basically the internet, come up with those files that we call the good files and the evil files, extract the millions of attributes that make the good file good and the millions of attributes that make the evil file evil, put integer values on those in some way that allows them to be ported over to an algorithm, a math model, that we call her Infinity, though I think her name's changing, that she can use in this predictive way to anticipate whether or not a file coming in, pre-execution, before it even executes, whether based on its attributes or its signature, or not signature, but its, its math score, whether it's likely to be bad or good. And we leverage that score, basically, to predict to the tune of what, when I heard this for the first time, I said, this is just not right. It can't be right. 99.7% accuracy. I said, given my 30 years in the field and how often I was compromised, usually by a nation state, because my antivirus, my signature-based antivirus had failed me, I said, 
you know, there was a team over at Dell that had first uncovered silence and had done this test. I said, they've just screwed up somehow. Uh, they, they, I just know it can't be right. The right's too good. Well, and that's why I, I'd just been compromised once again because my antivirus had failed me. I told the team, go get this BS solution, pull it in the back, run what this nation state just ran against us, and when it fails, let me know. Because I'll let Michael, because Michael Dell's quite excited about it. I said, stand down, I've got more important things to do than monkey around with this. Two days later, they came, the ops teams came to me with smiles on their faces. They said, boss, we don't want to tell you that leveraging the power of this math model pre-execution, predictively, means we would not have lost Christmas this last year. It's great that you can do it. Um, one of the, one of the <laughs> more interesting things in InfoSec lately has been um, uh, bad actors uh, you know, using, using the scale and power of the cloud um, to run their attacks. Um, and of course, there is now all sorts of AI as a service available. So uh, are we at the point where the bad guys also have this capability? Well, and there's never been a time, I think, in the history of man where technology hasn't arrived, where there's some clever soul out there who could probably make a very good living on the right side of the law, chose to leverage that intelligence he has in seeing how he can leverage the technology to some ill-gotten gain. Mm -hmm. And it, this, this technology will be, no, will be no different. It can't have had the impact that it's already having mm -hmm. on the dark net and the dark world and for them not to be thinking and working through this. Malcolm Harkins, who was the CISO of Intel, the same time I was the CISO over at Dell, it's interesting that the two heads of security for these behemoth IT companies would have had the gravitational attraction of silence pull them both to the company. And we rarely have time to sit as often together as we'd like, but occasionally so we need to sit more with our evil hats on and to sit and reflect and to think about the ways in which if we were so inclined, we could start to leverage or, or utilize this technology for our benefits. I think one of the things that's in our favor is that we're out of the blocks well in advance. I mean, we've been, we're just at our sixth year, but we were, you know, we've had product for three. We've been well in advance of them, and for them to, get to, to make up that is very difficult in the kind of uh, studies and things that we're doing. <laughs>